The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. After years of controversy, most scientists now agree that global warming is occurring at an alarming rate. But the debate continues about how best to reduce carbon emissions and thus slow climate change. Joining us to discuss our options is Steve Fetter, Dean of the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. He has studied and written about global warming. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besheroff. Steve Fetter. Welcome to the University of Maryland and Policy Watch. Actually, I don't know why I'm saying welcome to the University of Maryland since you are the dean of the School of Public Policy here at Maryland, but welcome anyway. Oh, thank you, Doug. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Oh, great. Now, um, the school is a leader in environmental studies, and I know that you have spent a great deal of your professional life thinking about the environment. On our minds these days, uh, besides pollution in general, of course, is the question of global warming. Help our audience here. For years there was this, quote, scientific debate about whether global warming was or was not happening. What was that about? Was it real? And, and, and how did it get resolved? Well, for many years there was an uncertainty about whether the changes in climate that we were observing, the gradual warming of the surface and other changes, was due to uh, human causes or whether it was just natural fluctuation. And that part of the debate is settled now. It's clear that climate is changing and changing in ways that indicate that humans are responsible. How did we, what was the argument? Was it going back a thousand or a million years, the Earth's temperature always shifted a little bit from here to there? And how did that get, how do we know now that this is a, 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 a now a change that we're just getting warmer? Well, looking back over the last 150 years, when humans had scientific instruments like thermometers, we could see that there was a fluctuation in temperature. And then we could look back over the last 1,000 years uh, using other data sources like tree rings and also see a year-to-year -year fluctuation. And over the last 50 years, we've seen a signal emerge out of that noise of the natural fluctuation. And it took time for that increase to rise high enough above the noise that we could confidently say that, uh, that there really is a uh, change in the climate occurring. And the uh, realization of that was first scientific and then political. Uh, I suppose we have to now mention the name Al Gore. Yes. How much of a role did he play in this? Uh, my perception is that he's played quite a large role, at least in uh, calling public attention to it. You know. As a scientific matter, this is not a new issue. There have been National Academy of Sciences studies going back to the 1970s and other studies going back even further into the 50s and the 1960s. But it's only recently that I think public attention has been focused on this, and I think Al Gore and his movie is a big reason for that. Now, some of the people I think on both sides of the debate are somewhat critical of that movie because it makes it seem as if the end of the world is near. Um, what can we expect from global warming, first of all, in the next 50 years? Well, there's still a lot we don't know about the climate system. There is a lot of uncertainty. And, uh, and it's not just about the climate system. We're unsure about how uh, human influences on the climate system will change over time. For example, how the population will increase, uh, how economies will change, and so on. But the best estimates are that over the next 50 to 100 years, there will be about three or four times as much warming as we've seen occur over the last 50 to 100 years. So there already is this perceptible warming of the Earth. And if we uh, keep going on our current path, uh, it's, that warming is expected to be about three or four times greater. And does that, what does that mean? The glaciers melt, icebergs, uh, Manhattan Island is underwater. <laughs> what, what, what do we expect? Well, uh, to date, the warming has been about one degree centigrade, about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is hard for the average person to perceive. 
there's been an increase in global sea level of about seven inches, roughly. Uh, we see a great decrease already in the uh, northern ice cap. For example, this year, for the first time in human history, the Northwest Passage opened. So you could sail from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. Well, that might not be such a bad thing. Well, there are some benefits to climate change, but... Uh, what the other benefits can we expect? Well, uh, heating bills in the, in the winter will certainly decrease, but those will be offset by increased cooling bills in the summer. And uh, in some cases, in some areas, crop yields may increase from warmer temperatures. So, for example, in Saskatchewan, they might expect to have higher crop yields in a longer growing season. But those will be offset by changes in other places, like the American Midwest, where it may get drier and hotter and yields will decrease. In the long run, is mankind at risk? Or humankind, I guess, is the right phrase to use well, now? I don't think the species as such is vulnerable. Uh, I think the poorest elements of uh, society are most at risk because they are most reliant on climate services because they depend for their livelihood on fishing or timber or agriculture and those are the sectors that are most vulnerable to climate change but I think we'd all be affected. That brings to my mind uh, the debate about the Kyoto Treaty which I read you know either ha is toothless or if it does have some um, uh, provisions that, that bite uh, they mainly hurt the industrial West. And then I read just a few days ago that even if the entire world adopted the Kyoto, Kyoto Treaty, we'd only postpone global warming by 15 minutes. Well, I think it's a little more than 15 minutes, but the Kyoto Treaty, even by its biggest proponents, was recognized as just being a first step. And it did only apply to the industrialized countries, and it only required those countries to make uh, very modest steps. Uh, the idea was that if the entire world, including the poorer countries, are going to bear costs uh, to deal with this problem, that the rich countries, the countries that in essence created the, pro the current problem, they should take the first step. They should lead the way. And so, now Kyoto was never meant to be uh, the final answer by any means. It was just meant to be a first small step on a path. Uh, the Bush administration certainly got itself on the wrong side of that argument. Uh, how did that happen given that the Clinton administration had opposed the treaty and the Senate, when I think controlled by Democrats, had rejected even considering the treaty uh, unanimously or close to that? How did the Bush administration end up on the wrong spin side of the treaty, let's put it that way. Well, I think uh, one major misstep was that they, they indicated that they didn't take the problem itself seriously initially. Mm -hmm. One of the first mm -hmm. steps of the Bush administration was to ask the National Academy of Sciences to do a study to see if there really was a scientific consensus about climate change. And uh, that study was done and concluded that there was, in fact, a consensus, and then the administration didn't have a policy to show that it was committed to taking this problem seriously. And it's unfortunate because I think they easily could have had um, a, an alternative policy to Kyoto that would have been serious. Now, you mentioned the developing world. Even if we gained control or some control over emissions in the industrialized world, uh, we have some major new economies that are joining the world community. Um, China will soon uh, be belching, I don't know how much more tonnage of whatever than, mm -hmm. than the U.S. It's true that the, uh, the rich countries uh, today are responsible for most of the greenhouse gases, the extra greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere. And that is why the poor countries look to us for leadership. They say, you're responsible for uh, the current problem. On the other hand, it's also true that most of the emissions for the next 50 to 100 years will be due to developing countries, and in particular, China and India will be the largest emitters. It's true that China will pass the United States as the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, and so it's imperative that they be part of any policy approach to solve the problem. I read about this new wonder car that the Indians are about to mm -hmm. adopt that's going to cost a thousand dollars or whatever uh, and it's just going to ruin whatever's left of their environment, right? 
if they make hundreds of thousands or millions of these cars? Well, I, I do think that what people are worried about is if Indian or Chinese driving habits come anywhere close to American driving habits, that it's hard to see how that situation is sustainable on using current technologies. Now, there is promise in moving to technologies that would be far less polluting, that would emit far fewer greenhouse gases. But aren't those technologies expensive? They uh, are today. But the U.S. could lead the way with other developed countries in reducing the costs of those. So, for example, uh, the uh, plug-in hybrid car is mm -hmm. uh, a hope that a lot of people turn to for the future of transportation uh, because you could largely use electricity to power cars. Now, of course, there's the question, where does that electricity come from? And if it comes from coal-fired power plants, maybe we're not so much better off. But that's something else we can talk about, is uh, what carbon-free energy sources we might be able to turn to. It almost seems to me uh, that you can go through all the forms of energy yeah. and there's something wrong with each one of them. Yeah. And at the end of the day, one scratches one's head. Let's start, though, with coal. Uh, there's still a lot of coal and coal shale, yeah. I think, uh, on this planet. Uh, can we ever use it safely? Yes, there are huge amounts of fossil fuel, and not just coal, but other fossil fuels like oil shale. And uh, one of the promising ideas is to uh, take the carbon out of coal, to gasify the coal, and turn it into other energy products like hydrogen, and to use those uh, with little pollution, greenhouse or otherwise. And then the question arises, what do you do with the carbon dioxide? And that is that that's a major concern. One idea is you can pump it into the ground, into deep aquifers or into abandoned oil and gas wells. But that's expensive using current technology, and there still are some safety concerns about that. And that's one area where the U.S. could exert leadership. Now, uh, oil shale was everybody's answer in the last uh, oil crisis. Yes. Uh, but I've given to understand that if oil stays at $100 a barrel, oil shale is suddenly economically feasible. Is that right? That, that, is, that is true. And there is oil shale today in Canada that's being turned into oil. The problem is that the release, one of the problems is that the release of greenhouse gases from that process is much higher than if you simply what an uh, irony. Yeah. burned oil. And so if we could develop a process that would allow us to use those energy resources but without releasing nearly as much carbon dioxide, then this might provide one path forward. Still, the total level of spending is relatively modest and because the payoff is so far in the future. And it depends on having policies in place, not just in the United States, but worldwide, to make this economical. Private companies are not willing to invest the uh, money that would be needed to bring this to market. And that's why uh, federal research and development is so expensive in a case like that. And, and even the federal or the U.S. might say, well, why are we the only ones paying for this? Um, are there plans? Are there proposals? Are there organizations? that are trying to create a worldwide market and make this more feasible to do the research? Well, it really is in its infancy. And in fact, there was a project in the United States called NextGen, and it was a uh, consortium backed by the federal government and some private companies to make this next generation coal plant that would take coal, turn it into a gas, separate out the hydrogen from the carbon dioxide. But I understand uh, that those companies just pulled out of the project. Be do you know why? No, they only, I think, supplied 20% of the funding. Yeah. Uh, and uh, perhaps they were not as, they, they didn't think the benefits that they were deriving from it were sufficient. Now, what about all these windmills? I drive through some rural areas and I see a mountainside full of windmills and I say, doesn't that look ugly? Some people thought the windmills were quite attractive. I personally preferred the uh, California hills without the windmills. Uh, and wind is economically attractive at current prices uh, in windy areas and uh, in places in Europe where you receive a tax credit for wind production, wind has really boomed. Uh, but one obstacle to wind growing uh, quite substantially is that it's an intermittent source. You can only produce electricity when the wind is blowing and when the wind isn't blowing, you need something else to back it up. Well, how much, uh, one mountainside, and I know that that's an imprecise measure, but how much electricity can one mountainside 
produce in an hour if the wind is blowing? Well, we have some big wind turbines in West Virginia on a ridge, and I believe each one of those produces about one megawatt uh, at its peak if the wind were blowing uh, full speed. Uh, so that would be about enough power, oh, maybe for two or three hundred households on average. So take a large city or even a modest-sized city of a few hundred thousand people, and you would need thousands of these wind turbines. So this is really not an answer in the long run? Well, I, it's part of an answer. Fair enough. But it can't be the answer all by itself. Water power? Well, we already use hydro. In fact, in the United States, hydro produces about 20 percent of our electricity. But there are environmental concerns with expanding it. Uh, in fact, water power is likely to decrease in the United States because of environmental concerns related to the flooding of valleys to build a, a reservoir. And most of the additional hydro capacity of the world is in South America and Africa in places where uh, we're reluctant to destroy that habitat. So I don't think that increased hydropower is, is even a significant part. But that seems odd to me, just to push this for a moment. Uh, now, we just decided that the fate of the species is not at stake, but it seems to me that global warming might be important enough so that we could spare a canyon or two. Well, but if that canyon is now full of vegetation, when you flood it, the vegetation decays and releases methane, which is a greenhouse gas. And some analyses have shown that, in fact, hydropower can uh, not save a lot of greenhouse gas emissions because of this effect. But there are just inherent limits to how much you can expand hydropower. Even if you were very aggressive, you might double it. But there is but this political problem here, which is people like their valleys. Yes. 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 And you don't want to destroy habitat for other reasons. Well, all right, I'm going through this list. Okay. Solar. Solar, I think, has great promise for the long term. A problem today is that solar photovoltaics, the solar cells that you might have on your calculator, are quite expensive. Mm -hmm. The electricity they produce is about five times more expensive than the electricity, say, from a new coal plant or gas plant, or a wind turbine, for that matter. Now, there are novel concepts that promise to reduce the price of photovoltaics. Even photovoltaic materials that you might uh, print with an inkjet printer or spray with a paint. Uh, they're not technically mature now, but I think they have a lot of promise. But again, one barrier to producing a lot of solar energy is that you only produce electricity when the sun is shining. So you'd need some way to store that electricity during the nighttime. For well, one way they store is they pump water up a hill, right? And then yes, let it come but down. you have a problem with the availability of reservoirs. Mm -hmm. There are other ideas uh, about having a cavern and using compressed gas, using a pump to mm. pump gas into a uh, salt cavern and then letting the gas back out to turn a turbine. Um, I'm rather fond of the idea of superconducting uh, transmission lines for the future. Now this is looking out maybe 50 years where we can transmit energy electricity between continents because the sun is always shining somewhere, somewhere. on earth. Fast now. Okay, help us for a minute. What would, what would such a cord power line look like? Well, the problem with uh, transmission today is you can't transmit electricity much more than a thousand miles because there's resistance in the line mm -hmm. and you lose electricity. It's being turned to heat. But in a superconducting cable, and these are being produced now on an experimental basis, are a thin ribbon of material with zero uh, electrical resistance. So you can, in theory, pump huge amounts of power electrical power through these cables with zero loss. Wow, wow. But again, they're today just in their infancy. Well, we have an industry that we haven't talked about yet, or a source of power uh, that prom had great promise in the 1950s and I guess or 60s, and uh, then got a black eye, or a number of black eyes. And of course, I'm talking about nuclear power. Uh, where are we on that? Well, of uh, all the sources you mentioned, nuclear is the one I'm most familiar with. And there was a, a boom in the construction of nuclear power in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And nuclear has leveled off in the United States. We have about 100 plants. And they provide about 20% of our electricity. Worldwide, there are about 450 plants that provide, I think, about 
of world electricity. There is uh, some new construction, mostly in East Asia, but uh, we're uh, at a critical juncture, I would say, with nuclear, where a lot of people are anticipating a nuclear renaissance, but it's not quite clear if it will happen. Well, let's go back a little bit to the past, just to yes. understand this a little bit. Um, the French, or at least the French, produce nuclear power for 80 the Germans. Eighty percent of their electricity of is produced with nuclear power. Uh, what do they do with their used fuel? Well, one key in the French case is they have one standard reactor design that they mass produced, and so this allowed them to build plants and operate them in a more orderly fashion. Uh, when they uh, discharge fuel from a reactor, they store it and reprocess it. They separate the plutonium in the fuel and use that to produce uh, new nuclear fuel. And then there still is radioactive waste that has to be disposed of in a geologic repository, just as the U.S. plans to dispose of its waste in a But as you suggest, the U.S. plants, as I understand it, each one is custom built. Yes. Yes. Uh, with all sorts of new requirements for a pipe here and a fitting there and well you better get everything right. Why was that? Why? Why? Well many of these plants were designed before Three Mile Island. They were designed in the uh, mid 1970s uh, or early 1970s when most of the orders were placed and then the Three Mile Island accident happened and uncovered a lot of um, a lot of changes were made to the plants. There were many retrofits or uh, redesigns and that did uh, serve to increase the price of nuclear power in the United States but but part of it was simply that electricity grew a uh, demand for electricity grew much slower than was expected in the United States and uh, nuclear turned out to be more expensive than was thought compared with uh, competitors coal and natural gas and so nuclear just leveled off we touched a little bit on the problem of spent fuel and we in the United States are in the midst of a grand debate about where to put this stuff. Mm. As I understand it, as of now, we leave it where it is. Is that right? Yes. We haven't yet moved it. Yes. The spent fuel that's discharged from a reactor is largely kept on site, either in ponds, like swimming pools, or in dry yeah, casks. But it, this is in canisters surrounded by cement or something, and then underwater. Yes. Water. They've got thick walls, and they're filled with water, and the fuel is immersed in that. But after a period of storage, a few years, it can be removed and stored above ground in a concrete cask. What are the chances that um, the way we'll deal with global warming, the way we'll help the Chinese, the Indians for electric power and other forms of, uh, of energy will be nuclear? Well, I think nuclear has some unique advantages over those other sources that we talked about in that it's the only one that is deployed on a very large commercial scale today and it's the only source of baseload electricity. In other words, you don't need to have to worry about the storage, pro the storage of electricity problem. <clears throat> and I think those advantages of nuclear could prove to be key. And I think, I'm personally convinced, that we, we have to have an option for the safe uh, expansion of nuclear power, both in the United States and worldwide. Well, uh, um, as we used to say, that's a $100 sentence. Uh, uh, the safe yes. uh, development. Uh, when you say safe, what do you mean? Well, I mean safe in two ways. Uh, I, first, safe against accidents at reactors. And I'm convinced that the reactors that we build in the United States, like water reactors, uh, can be operated safely, especially the new light water reactors, if you have an excellent safety culture and a good regulatory authority. Uh, as we do have in the United States or in France or Germany or Japan, that these reactors can be operated safely. But I also mean safe in the nonproliferation sense, that none of these technologies would be abused uh, to build nuclear weapons. Help us understand that a little bit. The, the Iranians, and I don't know the extent to which the North Koreans are saying, uh, well, we, we only want to develop nuclear power because we need the electricity. Um, we can put aside whether that, what, what validity that claim has, but how big a step is it from nuclear power to a nuclear weapon? Well, it, it depends what technologies a country has. Each of these light water reactors requires every year a supply of fuel, fresh fuel. 
And that fuel is enriched uranium. It's not uranium as it comes out of the ground, but uranium that has gone through a very sophisticated technical process that can separate out one isotope of uranium that's very rare in nature, U-235, and uh, concentrate it in the fuel. And the concern is that very same technology can be used to continue to enrich the uranium to the point where it is high enriched uranium, and that can be used for a bomb. That is a harrowing thought. And unfortunately, that's the thought that we have to end with today. Uh, but I hope you'll come back so that we can talk about nuclear proliferation. Steve Fetter, Dean of the School of Public Policy, University of Maryland, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Doug. And to our audience, please, if you have comments or questions or suggestions, please feel free to write to us at policywatch at umd.edu. That's umd for University of Maryland, dot edu. And for now, this is Doug Besheroff for Policy Watch. Thank you very much. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland.